So case number 32, uh, this is a 61 year old woman and uh, whose status is, uh, is post trauma. These are the images. So, uh, as you can see that uh, on the CT, we can see that there is uh, there are fractures of the uh, basispenoid. The basis, this is the fracture of the basispenoid and the left temporal bone present here. On the CT in geography images here, uh, we can see that uh, there is uh, this... Uh, early dense opacification of uh, both cavernous sinuses you know here there is early dense opacification of both cavernous sinuses here and uh, here this is the early dense opacification of both cavernous sinuses and the clival venous plexus which is shown here the clival venous plexus so there is dense, early dense opacification of both these and uh, injection of the left ICA, uh, this, this is the left ICA. So injection of the left ICA, internal, that is internal carotid artery, shows uh, that there is uh, arteriovenous shunting with opacification here. This is, uh, there is arteriovenous shunting with opacification of uh, both cavernous sinuses in the arterial phase here here this is the arteriovenous shunting with the opacification of uh, both cavernous sinuses in the arterial phase and uh, the venous outflow includes uh, both the uh, the venous outflow is shown here and it shows uh, uh, both the superior ophthalmic veins here, both the superior ophthalmic veins, that's the venous outflow, and along with the pterygoid venous plexus. So, this is the pterygoid plexus. This is the pterygoid plexus. Okay, so this is the pterygoid plexus. These are the superior ophthalmic veins that are being uh, superior ophthalmic veins that are showing that there is venous outflow here. And uh, Here we can see that uh, there is early dense opacification of both cavernous sinuses and the clival venous plexus here. So this is a case of uh, direct carotid cavernous fistula secondary to trauma. And uh, the, the clinically the differential diagnosis includes the uh, venous thrombosis and uh, intraorbital hematoma. However, with these images the diagnosis is quite clear. Next, uh, this is a case of a 65-year-old man uh, with six months progressive difficulty sleeping, uh, dizziness, diplopia, slurred speech, memory loss, and tremors. These are the images. So, the T2-weighted MRI sequence here shows subtle hyper intense signal here subtle very subtle hyper intense signal within the caudate head and putamen here okay so there is very subtle hyper intense signal within the caudate head both caudate head and putamen however this is the flare sequence and this is dwi and there is quite clearly here there is nearly symmetric hyper intensity there is symmetric hyper intense signal within the caudate head here and the anterior putamen the anterior putamen here you can see this is this is a, this is a dwi sequence and uh, it is again showing the hyper intensity in these both caudate heads and the anterior putamen also there is subtle here but uh, more there is quite similar but it is quite subtle abnormality there is again the hyper intense signal in both thalami here, but it is very subtle. There is very subtle abnormality of the thalamus. Also, uh, we can see that there is a relatively similar asymmetric abnormality 
this is quite asymmetrical abnormality uh, within the cortical ribbon of the temporal lobes and the left insula temporal lobes and the left insula here there is quite asymmetric abnormality here within the cortical ribbon of the temporal lobe and left insula so this is a case of Kruzfeldt Jakob disease this is a case of Kruzfeldt Jakob disease and uh, the differentials will include paraneoplastic encephalitis hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and Lee disease Next is a case of four-year-old child presenting with change in mental status of thermoplegia and dystonia. These are the images. So the CT scan uh, here shows uh, abnormal symmetric hypoattenuation in the uh, Chordate in the heads of the chordate nuclei, you know, bilaterally. So, there's uh, uh, abnormal symmetric hypoattenuation in the head of the chordate nuclei. The T2 weighted MRI sequence here shows uh, increased T2 signal uh, in again the same region that is the chordate nuclei. There is abnormal T2 hyper intensity here, and uh, here this is DWI, and again it is showing the hyper intense signal here. Uh, which is uh, consistent with restricted diffusion. So, the axial, this is the axial T2 weighted MRI, uh, more inferiorly, it is done at, it is at the level of the midbrain and uh, it shows the uh, symmetric signal abnormality in the dorsal and the lateral midbrain. So, this is the dorsal region and this is the lateral region and we can see that there is symmetric abnormality here as well at the level of the midbrain in the dorsal and the lateral regions of the midbrain. So this is a case of Lee disease and uh, the differentials will include hypoxic ischemic injury. Next is a case of 43 year old man presenting with the altered mental status and uh, these are the images. So, there is signal abnormality here within the central pons, which is uh, hyper intense on T2 weighted images and it is hypo intense on T1 weighted sequences and uh, it is sparing the periphery, it spares the periphery and the cortical spinal tracts. It is sparing the periphery and the cortical spinal tracts here. Also, on the post contrast sequence, uh, there is no abnormal enhancement here and there is no, sorry, this is DWI. So, there is no restricted diffusion here. There is no restricted diffusion here. There is no restricted diffusion shown here, okay. There is no restricted diffusion in the pawns here. So, this is a case of central uh, pontine myelinolysis or we can say osmotic demyelination syndrome. This is a case of uh, osmotic demyelination syndrome and the differentials will include of course uh, the brain stem glioma because of the region and the appearance, brain stem glioma, infarction of course, multiple sclerosis and any uh, toxin exposure and uh, hypertensive encephalopathy. So, next is uh, the case of a 50-year-old man uh, presenting with two hours of aphasia and uh, right-sided weakness. These are the images. So, as we can see here that uh, on the non-contrast CT scan, uh, there is no evidence of infarction or hemorrhage or mass. This is quite unremarkable study here. I mean, we can't see any infarction here or hemorrhage or mass. But, however, on DWI, there is a small area of restricted diffusion here in the left corona radiata and putamen. In the left corona radiata and putamen, there is a, a very small area of restricted diffusion. So, this is the mean transit time mapping. This is the mean transit time mapping which is obtained using the dynamic susceptibility contrast perfusion and it reveals a region of prolonged transit time here 
this is the region of prolonged transit time and this area of uh, a relative hypoperfusion is actually it is much larger than DWI abnormality which is shown here so here on DWI we can see there is a very little area of restricted diffusion however on the mean transit time mapping we can see that there is a quite large area uh, of relative hypoperfusion this is the CT and geography image and it shows the left MCA stem occlusion here here we can see that the left MCA stem is occluded and uh, However, the, the uh, however we can see that there is uh, the opacification of the distal left MCA vessels from the collaterals reconstitution. You know, so the, the distal MCA vessels are shown here with the because of the collaterals. However, here we can see that there is occlusion of the MCA stem. So this is a case of uh, left left middle cerebral artery thromboembolism, uh, which is uh, also. Uh, showing the perfusion diffusion mismatch here. So this is left MCA thromboembolism, and uh, there's little di the, in the differentials. I mean, we cannot put other differentials here because it's quite clear, and just little di diagnostic dilemma here in this case. Uh, based on CT alone, however, uh, any of the several stroke mimics uh, could be included. That is a seizure or a migraine, and all of these stroke mimics could be included based on CT alone. However. Um, these images are quite consistent with left middle cerebral artery thromboembolism. Next case is of a 7 year old boy presenting with nausea, ataxia and vomiting. These are the images. So we can see uh, that uh, here there is a well expensile, there is an expensile well demarcated mass uh, which is uh, centered within the pons here it is centered within the pons and this is expensile very well demarcated mass and uh, it is actually it is t2 hyper intense okay this is t2 here we can see that this is the t2 hyper intense mass this is the t2 hyper intense mass which is centered within the pons and uh, on the post contrast sequence there's no abnormal enhancement in this re in this mass you know so this is a post contrast sequence and there's no abnormal enhancement in this mass and it is t2 hyper intense centered within the pons also on the mr spectroscopy uh, there is a choline creatinine ratio which is greater than 2 ratio 1 and uh, here is the choline creatinine ratio here is the choline peak this is the creatinine peak and it is greater than 2 ratio 1 and uh, this is the na peak and aa peak non acetylestine acetyl, this is the naa peak and uh, there is marked reduction in the na peak we can see this marked reduction in the na peak uh, so this is uh, quite consistent with the diffuse pontine glioma this picture this imaging picture along with this uh, mrs uh, spectroscopy MR spectroscopy uh, ratio that is the uh, choline creatinine ratio greater than 2 ratio 1 and uh, a marked reduction in the NAR peak is consistent with the diffuse pontine glioma and the differentials will include brainstem encephalitis, demyelinating disease, any demyelinating disease that is ADAM, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis and osmotic demyelination because of the location of the pons, osmotic demyelination can also be included here and neurofibromatosis type 1. Next is a case of a 60 year old woman uh, with 4 months history of progressive gait instability, headache and uh, altered mental status. These are the images. So we can see that there is a large solid and cystic mass. This is large solid and cystic mass within the body of the left lateral ventricle and it is causing the obstructive hydrocephalus here. On the non cross CT, the mass is hidden uh, with, the, with the mild general hyperattenuation and foci of coarse calcification here. These are the foci of coarse calcification. On MRI, the solid component is, uh, it is mixed it is giving mixed signals on T2 MRI, that is it is hypo 
and hyper intense. It is hypo and hyper intense on T2 weighted MRI. On T1 weighted and flare sequences, this is the flare sequence. Uh, uh, it is ISO2 hypo intense. Okay, so it is the uh, on uh, sorry on uh, T1 weighted imaging, it is ISO2 hypo intense here. However, on T2, it is giving mixed signal hypo and hyper intensity. And on post contrast sequence, we can see that there is heterogeneous enhancement on post contrast sequences. So on post post contrast, it is giving heterogeneous enhancement. On the T1 weighted image, it is ISO2 hypo. On T2, it is hypo. It is hypo and hyper both. It is giving mixed signals. On CT, we can see that there are central foci. There is some foci of calcification along with there is mixed attenuation. It, it, it is of solid and cystic mass. It is solid and cystic mass within the body of the left lateral ventricle causing the obstructive hydrocephalus. So, the di diagnosis is of central neurocytoma. This is a very typical imaging uh, picture. I would say that the, on the imaging uh, description is very typical of central neurocytoma. And the differentials, in the differentials, we can include oligodendroglioma, subependymal giant cell astrocytoma, ependymoma, low grade or pilocytic astrocytoma, uh, considering the location of the ventricles, choroid plexus papilloma could also be included, and meningioma, of course. So, next case uh, is of a two year old boy uh, presenting with three days uh, history of intermittent fever, lethargy, nausea, and vomiting. And uh, the lumbar puncture revealed the leukocytosis, CSF leukocytosis. So, these are the images. So, on the flare sequence, we can see that there is hyper intense signal in the subdural spaces along both frontal lobes. We can say both frontal lobes, predominantly right, but it is involving the left frontal lobe as well. So, along both frontal lobes, there is hyper intense signal. Uh, and on the post contrast uh, sequence, this is the post contrast, uh, we can see that there is a, a right sided, this is a right sided and uh, a rim enhancing subdural collection here. There is a right sided rim enhancing subdural collection here on the post contrast T1 weighted sequence. On DWI, the majority of the material inside this collection in this collection is hyper intense. So, it is hyper intense, the contents of the collection, the contents of the collection are hyper intense on DWI. So, this is a case of subdural empyema. And uh, in the differentials, we can include epidural abscess or subdural effusion or subacute or chronic subdural hematoma. Next case, 44-year-old man uh, presenting uh, with slow progressive decline in functional status. And these are the images. So, the flare image here shows numerous large hyper intense lesions in the bilateral deep white matter in the bilateral deep white matter there are numerous large hyper intense lesions and uh, many of these lesions uh, uh, they have a long axis which is uh, perpendicular uh, to the surface of the ventricles uh, that is uh, actually the textbook description of these lesions i mean uh, that presentation will be quite evident on the sagittal view uh, these lesions that they are perpendicular to the surface of the ventricles. However, in this axial image, we can see that there are large hyper intense lesions in the bilateral deep white matter. Also, there is little mass effect associated with these lesions. And uh, this is the post contrast sequence and it shows rim enhancement. Here, we can see that there is rim enhancement about some of these lesions. Here, there is rim enhancement. Here, there is rim enhancement, but it is incomplete. There is almost complete rim enhancement here, but this one is incomplete, this one is incomplete, so there is incomplete rim enhancement here. So, this is actually the case of multiple sclerosis. Uh, this is a case of multiple sclerosis. The main uh, diagnosis here will be multiple sclerosis. In the differentials, we can put ADAM, there is acute dissimulated encephalomyelitis, encephalitis, uh, cerebral and catazil, catazil as well, that is cerebral autosomal dominant arteriopathy with sub subcortical infarcts and leukoencephalopathy, that is uh, cadacil. We can put cadacil here as well in the differential and vasculitis. So, next is a case of a 36-year-old man presenting with headache. And uh, these are the images. 
So the CT scan shows a small mass in the anterior uh, superior third ventricle here in the anterior superior third ventricle there is a small mass with attenuation which is quite similar to the gray matter. So attenuation is quite similar to the gray matter. However, it is uh, quite uh, hyper intense. This lesion is hyper intense on uh, flare on flare and T1 weighted sequences. It's quite hyper intense on flare and T1 weighted sequences here. It's hyper intense. And on post contrast sequence, there is uh, no contrast enhancement. I mean, Obviously, it was hyper intense on uh, T1 and flare, so there is no definite enhancement on the post contrast sequence. So, this is a case of colloid cyst, and uh, the differentials uh, based only if we uh, a solitary lesion in this uh, location with these uh, imaging characteristics is quite uh, specific for colloid cyst. This is a quite a typical imaging presentation of colloid cyst. However, based if, if there is only CT image provided, then the differentials can include aneurysm. Here, the, the differential will include aneurysm or because of considering the location craniopharyngioma or uh, meningioma or subependymoma, uh, neurocysticercosis or glial or neuronal neoplasm. Next case is a 35 year old woman uh, presenting with headache. These are the images. Chest x ray is also provided here. So, because uh, obviously the chest x ray has been provided and uh, co correlating it with the MRI, so it is quite uh, obvious. However, we are going to proceed with the typical description uh, as uh, initially that uh, the post contrast. Uh, T1 weighted MRI is uh, actually it shows the thick nodular uh, leptomeningeal enhancement which is uh, most uh, prominent along the sylvian fissures here it is most prominent along the sylvian fissures here and the basilar cisterns and the basal cisterns sorry the basal cisterns so this is the thick nodular leptomeningeal enhancement that we are talking about and uh, also on the chest x-ray we can see that there is bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy on chest x-ray. So, co co correlating it with these findings, the chest x-ray findings, our main diagnosis will be neurosarcoidosis. This is the case of neurosarcoidosis and in the differentials, we can put tuberculosis, carcinomatous meningitis, lymphoma, vaginal cradle mitosis and Langerhans cell histiocytosis. In the differentials, we can put them but the main diagnosis here is neurosarcoidosis. So, uh, next case is of a term infant who presenting with the hypotonia and new onset seizures and uh, these are the images. So on the non-contrast uh, CT scan, the surface of the brain appears abnormally smooth with near complete absence of normal sci. I mean there are absolutely no sursal sci, almost no sursal sci visible here. And there is quite smooth appearance of the brain. The brain is appearing quite abnormally smooth with near complete absence of normal cell size. The T2 weighted MRI uh, shows an abnormally smooth brain surface. Again, here is abnormally smooth brain surface. And uh, here we can see that uh, there is a thick band of, uh, there is a thick band of gray matter within the substance of the white matter yeah there's a thick band of gray matter within the substance of the white matter uh, here here there's a thick band of gray matter within the substance of the white matter here which is separated from the cortex this is the band i'm talking about thick band of gray matter yeah, within the substance of the white matter and it is separated from the cortex uh, by a thin uh, so-called thin so-called cell sparse zone of white matter. Here this is the cell sparse zone cell sparse zone of white matter. And this is the thick band of gray matter. And uh, also, we can see that the lateral ventricles here are dysmorphic. 
they are dysmorphic appearing lateral ventricles. So, this is a quite typical imaging uh, presentation of lysencephaly. This is a case of lysencephaly, smooth appearing brain parenchyma. This is a case of lysencephaly. And in the differentials, uh, we can put uh, prematurity here, severe prematurity, band heterotopia because of this band of gray matter, band heterotopia, and congenital uh, cytomegalovirus infections. Next is a case of 34 year old woman from Central America presenting with headache and seizures. These are the images. So, the flare sequence shows uh, extensive hyperintensity. Uh, likely, this is vesogenic edema. This is extensive hyperintensity in the white matter of the cerebral hemispheres, of both cerebral hemispheres. In the white matter of both cerebral hemispheres, there is extensive hyperintensity. On the post contrast sequence, uh, we can see that there are multiple rim enhancing lesions within the cerebral hemispheres. These are the rim enhancing lesions. There are multiple rim enhancing lesions within the cerebral hemispheres. Uh, the cystic lesions uh, with mural enhancement, they lie within the occipital horns of the lateral ventricles. So, here are, there are the cystic lesions with mural enhancement and uh, they are shown here within the occipital horns of the, here the cystic lesions with mural enhancement are present within the occipital horns of the uh, lateral ventricles. This is the CT scan from a different patient and it shows multiple small cerebral calcifications from a different patient. So, this is basically shown here because these uh, multiple small cerebral calcifications can also be presenting in this case with uh, this is, uh, the case of neurocysticercosis. So, basically this is a case of neurocysticercosis and uh, the differentials can include septic emboli or fungal or mycobacterial or amoebic abscesses, metastatic tumors or tumefactive demyelination. Next is the case of a 44-year-old patient uh, presenting with headache and uh, these are the images. Now, we can see that there is a large cystic extraaxial mass. This is the cystic extra axial mass within the left sylvian fissure. So, this mass is present within the left sylvian fissure. So, both CT and MRI images are showing an air fluid level. There is an air fluid level here as we can see. This is an air fluid level. This is an air fluid level here with fat which is layering anteriorly within the cyst. Okay, this is the fat which is layering anteriorly within the cyst and uh, the fat shows a uh, hyper intense it is this the, how we how do we know this is fat because this is hyper intense on uh, t1 and uh, it is uh, on ct it is of low attenuation so this is fat so here we can see that this is the air fluid level with fat layering anteriorly within this cyst within this basically the cystic lesion large cystic extra axial mass within the left cilian fissure. Also, we can see here that uh, there is a chemical shift artifact at the fat fluid interface on the T2. This is the T2 weighted sequence. So, there is chemical shift artifact here uh, as we can see. So, also on the CT scan, we can see uh, that there are calcifications present here. There are calcifications along the margins of the cyst. This is a large cystic lesion. This is the fat and this is the calcification which is present along the margin of the cyst. So, these imaging pictures are quite characteristic of dermoid cyst. This is a dermoid cyst. In the differential, we can include teratoma, craniopharyngioma, lipoma or epidermoid cyst. Next is a case of a 53 year old woman presenting with left sided sensory neural hearing loss and uh, these are the images. So, we can see 
that uh, there is an extra axial mass in the left cerebellopontine angle which is uh, centered above the internal auditory canal this is the internal auditory canal which is centered above the internal auditory canal in the left cerebellopontine angle and this lesion is uh, iso intense to white matter on uh, the pre contrast uh, we can say that uh, on the pre contrast T1 weighted uh, image, it is iso intense. Here, it is iso intense to white matter on the pre contrast T1 weighted image, and it is enhancing uniformly on the post contrast sequence. This uniform enhancement. Also, uh, we can see that uh, there is a tail of dural enhancement which is extending into the internal auditory canal. This is the tail here. So there's a tail of dural enhancement which is extending into the internal auditory canal. So these imaging uh, descriptions are quite characteristic for the meningioma of the cerebellopontine angle. So this is the case of meningioma of the cerebellopontine angle. In the other differentials, we can include schwannoma, vestibular schwannoma, metastasis, lymphoma, and trigeminal schwannoma. Next is a case of a 31 year old man with the SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus, admitted with visual auras, uh, fever, and positive blood culture. So, we can see uh, on MRI, we can see that on MRI, there is a on flare here on flare sequence, we can see that there is a a focal subcortical lesion in the left parietal lobe here this is a subcortical lesion focal subcortical lesion in the left parietal lobe with heterogeneous here heterogeneous uh, hyper intense signal on uh, flare sequence and uh, this is the post contrast sequence and uh, we can see that there is a heterogeneous hyper intensity here this heterogeneous hyper intensity here in the left parietal lobe and it is uh, giving mild mass effect there is mild mass effect here in this region the ct angiogram shows a small site here of aneurysmal dilatation there here there is a small site of aneurysmal dilatation in the distal uh, here in the distal left mca branch this is the distal distal left mca branch and there is a tiny focus there is a small site of aneurysmal dilatation the catheter angiogram here is showing that focal uh, fusiform aneurysm here in this image this was the ct angiogram image and here we were talking about that small site of uh, aneurysmal dilatation in the distal left mca and this is the catheter angiogram and it shows the focal fusiform aneurysm here in the distal branch of the mca and uh, also there is irregular narrowing in the there is irregular narrowing in the parent vessel at this site there is irregular narrowing in the parent vessel at this site so this is a case of mycotic aneurysm this is mycotic aneurysm and in the differentials we can put vasculitis vasculopathy and dissecting aneurysm or uh, intravascular lymphoma in a very rare rare presentation you can say the intravascular lymphoma however vasculitis and dissecting aneurysm are the main differentials here next is uh, a neonate presenting with facial anomalies hypotonia and microcephaly these are the images so this is the axial ct scan and it shows a large rounded ventricle and uh, there is a fully circumferential, we can say rind, there is a fully circumferential, circumferential rind of uh, brain tissue around the ventricle. Here, this is the circumferential rind of brain tissue around this enlarged rounded ventricle. The axial and the coronal T2 weighted MRI sequences show the absence of uh, septum pellucidum. There is no septum pellucidum here with a large single monoventricle. This is the large single monoventricle. Also, uh, we can see that there is a fusion of the frontal lobes uh, anteriorly. There is fusion of the frontal lobes anteriorly 
and a fusion of the thalami in the midline here there is fusion of the thalami there is fusion of the thalami and frontal lobes in the midline so this is a typical case of uh, allobar uh, holoprosencephaly this is a case of allobar holoprosencephaly and in the differentials we can put severe hydrocephalus with ruptured septum pellucidum hydranencephaly a large bilateral open lip schizencephaly and agenesis of the corpus callosum with large interhemispheric cyst next is a case of 3 year old child presenting with developmental delay and seizures since infancy and uh, these are the images so we can see that uh, there is a smooth here there is a smooth band like layer of abnormal tissue which is running parallel to the cortex uh, deep within the substance of the white matter and uh, it follows the uh, t1 and uh, here this is the t1 weighted image this is t2 weighted image so it follows the t1 and t2 signal intensity of uh, gray matter it is actually here this is the gray matter the gray matter the gray matter gray matter so on all sequences here these are the coronal pictures and this is the band of this is this that abnormal band uh, abnormal uh, tissue smooth band like abnormal tissue and it is following the signal intensity of gray matter on t1 and t2 both so this is a case of uh, band heterotopia this is a case of band heterotopia and in the differentials uh, we can put lysencephaly and zellweger syndrome next is a 13 year old patient presenting with headache and uh, these are the images so we can see that uh, on uh, sagittal t1 weighted mri there is abnormal expansion of the tectal plate by rounded mass this is the region of the tectal plate and there is abnormal expansion of the tectal plate with this rounded mass the axial t2 weighted mri uh, and uh, the post contrast sequence here so they are showing uh, uh, this lesion here and this is actually t2 hyper intense this is t2 hyper intense lesion and uh, on post contrast sequence we can see that there is no definite enhancement in this lesion so it is non enhancing it is t2 hyper intense it is non enhancing and uh, it is t2 hyper intense here and uh, it is in the location of the tectal plate also uh, there is a uh, hydrocephalus as we can see here there is hydrocephalus with enlargement of the third and the lateral ventricles due to the obstruction caused by this uh, lesion it, it is basically causing the stenosis of the aqueduct it is causing the stenosis of the cerebral aqueduct so because of that obstruction it is causing the obstructive hydrocephalus so this is a case of uh, tectal glioma this is a case of tectal glioma and uh, in the differentials uh, we can include uh, aqueductal stenosis that is uh, non neoplastic aqueductal stenosis and uh, metastasis and any penile tumor so we can put them in the differential as well next is uh, a case of a 3 year old boy uh presenting with behavioral change and uh, progressive uh, difficulty in walking these are the images so as you can see that there is uh, this is the axial t2 weighted mri and it is uh, showing abnormal uh, confluent hyper intensity in the white matter of the centrum semi ovale and corona radiata in a typical uh butterfly like configuration so this is called a butterfly like configuration you know this is a typical butterfly like configuration 
and there is abnormal hyperintensity in the white matter of the centrum semi ovale and the coronal radiata also there are multiple linear here we can see the, these are the multiple linear tigroid stripes tigroid stripes in the white matter and uh, these are the multiple linear tigroid stripes in the white matter and uh, the subcortical here the subcortical uh, white matter u fibers they remain relatively spared in most areas so the subcortical these are the subcortical uh, white matter u fibers and they are appearing relatively spared the sparing of the subcortical u matter fibers so also we can see that there is mild uh, cerebral volume loss as well there is mild cerebral volume less volume loss because of this uh, dilatation these these cells you can see that there is mild cere cerebral volume loss on the uh, pre contrast and post contrast t1 weighted sequences uh, we can see that there is uh, no contrast enhancement in these areas of white matter abnormality so we can see that there is no definite enhancement or definite or i would say no enhancement is absolutely no enhancement in these regions of white matter abnormalities so this is a case of metachromatic leukodystrophy and uh, this is a case of metachromatic leukodystrophy and in the differentials we can include uh, periventricular leukomalacia and torch infections and krebs disease next is case of a 48 year old man uh, with hiv and uh, presenting with one week of frontal headache he presents to the er with left sided weakness so as you can see that uh, on the post contrast uh, sequences there are several large uh, rim enhancing lesions these are the large rim enhancing lesions in the cerebral hemispheres these these rim enhancing lesions are present in the cerebral hemispheres and this is a rim enhancing lesion in the midbrain so these are the rim enhancing lesions and uh, they are uh, present in uh, both basal ganglia as well here in the basal ganglia and subcortical white matter see this is this present in it is here in basal ganglia and subcortical white matter this these rim enhancing lesions this is in the midbrain the t2 weighted uh, this is the t2 weighted mri and it is showing that there is surrounding edema here and there is some heterogeneous internal signal so there is surrounding edema with heterogeneous internal signal and uh, these lesions on dwi uh they are actually iso intense on dwi you know so there is no definite uh we say restricted diffusion in these lesions because they are not hyper intense on dwi they are iso intense on dwi so this is a case of uh, cns toxoplasmosis uh this is uh, the basic uh, differential here cns toxoplasmosis and among the other differentials in the setting of uh, hiv or other immunocompromised states uh, we can put lymphoma and mycobacterial fungal or pyogenic abscesses and the metastatic tumors of course so this is uh, a case of 9 year old presenting with headache and uh, seizures and uh, these are the images so as you can see that there is a left parietal lobe mass which is extending from the cortex to the periventricular white matter and it has heterogeneous signal characteristics uh, which are predominantly hyper intense on t2 and uh, there are cystic and uh, nodular of course nodular uh, enhancing components here this is the post contrast sequence so there is some nodular enhancement in this region i wouldn't say homogeneous or it is nodular enhancement this is nodular enhancement in this region and uh, also these are the cystic areas uh, which are shown here these are cystic areas and this is the nodular enhancement in this region so this 
lesion is giving relatively mild mass effect. There is no mass effect evident here. So there is relatively mild mass effect for its size and there is very little uh, surrounding edema here. I mean, we can see that there is no lots and lots of edema here. There is very little, there is mild surrounding edema compared to the size of this lesion. Also, note that uh, here you can see that there is linear dural enhancement. This is the dura which is enhancing here adjacent to the mass. This is the linear dural enhancement of the mass. So these imaging characteristics are uh, typical for pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma. This is a case of pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma. And in the differentials, we can put ganglioglioma, pilocytic astrocytoma, and uh, DNET, that is this embryoplastic neuroepithelial tumor because of its cystic and bubbly appearance, and oligodendroglioma as well. Another case, uh, this is a case of 57-year-old woman presenting with decreased vision in one eye. These are the images. So as you can see, uh, that there is uh, abnormal material within the expanded left cavernous sinus. So this is the cavernous sinus which is expanded here. There is abnormal material in it. And uh, it is uh, iso intense on T1 and uh, mildly hyper intense on T2. Here, mildly hyper intense on uh, T2, iso intense on uh, here. We can see that this is iso intense on T1 and uh, it is hyper intense on uh, here. It is mildly hyper intense on uh, T2 and uh, it is enhancing homogeneously. And this mass encases and mildly narrows the left uh, cavernous internal uh, carotid artery shown here. This is the left internal carotid artery. This is the left internal carotid artery on coronal sequence. And this mass is encasing uh, this uh, internal carotid artery and it is mildly narrowing it and uh, here we can see that there is uh, an enhancing dural tail this is the dural tail which is enhancing uh, along the petrous apex along the petrous apex this is the dural tail here this is the dural tail here which is enhancing along the petrous apex and this mass uh, seems to be extending into the left orbital apex here where it exerts the it is it is exerting the mass effect on, on the optic nerve so we can see that the optic nerve here is being pushed towards this side uh, because of the mass effect which is being produced here by this uh, lesion which is extending into the left orbital apex so these imaging pictures are uh, quite uh, descriptive for cavernous sinus meningioma. This is a case of cavernous sinus meningioma. And uh, in the differentials, we can put nerve sheath tumor, pituitary adenoma, uh, chordoma or chondrosarcoma metastasis, sarcoidosis or any other granulomatous process, and Toulouse-Hunt syndrome. Toulouse-Hunt syndrome. So, another case uh, of a four-month-old child with the large head size. The child presented with large head size. These are the pictures. So, uh, we can see that on CT and on MRI, both uh, we can see that there is an enlarged fourth ventricle and there is cystic dilatation of the posterior fossa here. So there is cystic dilatation of the posterior fossa and enlarged fourth ventricle. The uh, torcula here, we can see that the torcula is located much more superiorly than normal. Normally, it is located here, almost here. So this is located much more superiorly than the normal location of the torcula. And uh, the cerebellar vermis is... Uh, Obviously, we can see here that the cerebellar vermis is uh, severely hypoplastic and uh, 
there's the, the hypoplastic here we can see that cerebellar worm is, is severely hypoplastic and the cerebellum is rotated upwards here the cerebellum is rotated upwards and the cerebellar hemispheres are quite small here we can see that the cerebellar hemispheres are quite small they're slightly small and uh, the vermis is absent it's hypoplastic severely hypoplastic and the cerebellum is rotated upwards so this is a, a typical presentation of dandy walker malformation this is a case of dandy walker malformation and in the differentials we can put hypoplastic vermis with rotation uh, that is formerly it was called dandy walker variant now it is called hypoplastic vermis with rotation mega cisterna magna is another differential retrocerebellar arachnoid cyst and cerebellar hypoplasia. Next is uh, a 58 year old man presenting with ataxia, slurred speech, difficulty swallowing, involuntary laughing, rigidity, and uh, bradykinesia. These are the uh, imaging sequences. So, as we can see, that uh, on the here on the sagittal uh, t1 weighted mri we can see that there is marked atrophy of the pons and cerebellum okay so there is marked atrophy of the pons and the cerebellum the t2 weighted images here they show here you can see that there are coronally and sagittally oriented bands of hyper intense signal in the pons these are the bands the hyper intense bands that are coronally and sagittally oriented hyper intense signals in the pons and uh, there is a very uh, subtle hyper intense signal along the lateral uh, margin of the putamen yeah so we can see that there is quite subtle hi, subtle hyper intense signal along the lateral margin of the putamen so this typical this is typical imaging presentation it is called hot cross bun sign of the uh, multiple system atrophy this is msa this is a case of msa multiple system atrophy and this is a typical presentation the hot cross bun sign of the msa among the differentials, we can put olivopontocerebellar degeneration and spinocerebellar ataxia. Next is uh, a 46-year-old woman presenting with altered mental status uh, nine days after the coil occlusion of a ruptured cerebral aneurysm. And these are the imaging cases. So, we can see that... Uh, This is the MIP image uh, from the day 9 of the CT angiogram and uh, it is showing multiple areas of narrowing. These are the multiple areas of narrowing here uh, in the proximal middle cerebral arteries bilaterally. You know, here we can see this is the area of narrowing, this is the area of narrowing, this is the area of narrowing, area of narrowing here. So, this was on admission this mip image was obtained on admission and this mip image is from nine days later after the coil occlusion of this ruptured cerebral aneurysm so this narrowing is quite evident here if you compare this region with this region so this is okay and here you can see that there is narrowing in the uh, proximal middle cerebral arteries bilaterally now, these uh, AP projection cerebral angiograms also reveal multiple areas of uh, uh, moderate and uh, severe narrowing. These are the on admission images and here these are the images from the day 9 angiogram and we can see here that there are multiple areas of moderate and severe narrowing involving the intracranial internal carotid and the proximal here the proximal anterior and middle cerebral arteries okay 
so these are the multiple areas of narrowing and uh, the stenosis have smooth margins and they occur over relatively long segments of the vessels they occur relatively uh, yes long segments of the vessels and uh, also as you can see here that uh, there is an incidental unruptured right internal carotid artery aneurysm here this is the aneurysm this is the aneurysm okay it is unruptured aneurysm of the right internal carotid artery so this is a case of uh, cerebral vasospasm and uh, in the differentials we can include intracranial atherosclerosis and cns vasculitis or vasculopathy next is a 46 year old woman uh, with one day history of uh, headache uh, she was found unconscious uh, the next day and uh, in the emergency room she is afebrile and uh, she is uh, afebrile normotensive and unresponsive these are the images so there is a hyper intense signal uh, in the sulci and the basal cisterns there is hyper intense signal in the basal cisterns and uh, in the cisterns and in the sulci as you can see on the flare sequence of course and there is a thin abnormal enhancement in these regions on the post contrast sequences this thin abnormal enhancement is noted and uh, is it is noted in the supracellular cistern and along the surface of the midbrain here you can see along the surface of the midbrain and in the supracellular cistern there is thin abnormal enhancement on the post contrast uh, t1 weighted images there uh, is a subtle enhancement in the sulci about uh, the inferior frontal lobes you know about the inferior frontal lobes there is subtle uh, enhancement and uh, there is moderate ventriculomegaly here, of course, by the enlargement of the temporal horns. So the temporal horns appear enlarged here, and there is moderate ventriculomegaly. And uh, also, we can see that there is hyper intense signal in the periventricular white matter on flare, and there is subependymal enhancement. See here, there is subependymal enhancement here and there is a hyperintense signal in the periventricular white matter there is signal abnormality and uh, abnormal enhancement in the left uh, cerebral peduncle here which is consistent with subacute infarction or abscess so this is a case of bacterial meningitis and ventriculitis because of the subependymal enhancement here as you can see so there's subependymal enhancement here so ventriculitis will definitely be considered along with the bacterial meningitis and in the differentials uh, we can put carcinomatous meningitis lymphoma leptomeningeal dissemination of primary cns tumor sarcoidosis langerhans cell histiocytosis and chemical meningitis secondary to ruptured dermoid or any intrathecal medication next is a case of 30 year old man presenting with the headaches and psychosis and uh, these are the images so as you can see that there is a mass within the interhemispheric fissure with the undulating borders as you can see here that uh, this is the mass this is the mass here this is the mass here uh, in the uh, within the interhemispheric fissure it has uh, undulating borders as you can see these are the undulating borders that uh, scallop the bilateral they are scalloping the bilateral medial frontal lobes you know so they are scalloping the bilateral medial frontal lobes and uh, this lesion is uh, as you can see on the post contrast sequence that it is non-enhancing 
and it has signal characteristics uh, very similar to the uh, CSF on CT. Here you can see that the signal characteristics are very similar to CSF on CT as well as on T2 weighted MRI as well as on uh, T1 weighted MRI uh, and uh, there is no enhancement in this lesion. However, it is hyper intense on DWI, you know, it is hyper intense on DWI and there is mild heterogeneous signal on flare sequence. This is the flare sequence, this mild heterogeneous signal noted here. There are few foci of hyper intensity in this lesion and uh, this is the DWI which is showing a very hyper intense signal in this region. So these imaging characteristics are quite typical for uh, the epidermoid cyst. So this is a case of epidermoid cyst and uh, in the differentials we can put arachinoid cyst or we can put abscess or dermoid cyst. Next case is a 21 year old man uh, status post motor vehicle collision and uh, these are the images. So as you can see that on CT uh, there are multiple multiple small uh, hemorrhagic foci. The, these are the multiple small hemorrhagic foci or foci at the cortical uh, here at the cortical gray white matter junction and here in the right thalamus. So this is the focal hyper intense hemorrhagic focus in the right thalamus. This is in the cortical gray white matter junction. On susceptibility weighted imaging, uh, we can see SWI sequence, uh, we can see that there are many more sites of hemorrhage. Uh, there are many more sites of hemorrhages which are visible as small foci of signal loss. So these are small foci of signal loss on susceptibility weighted imaging sequences, SWI sequences. So considering the history of trauma and uh, these uh, multiple small foci of, uh, uh, you know, uh, blooming blood products, we can say that this is a case of diffuse axonal injury. This is the case of diffuse axonal injury, DAI, and in the differentials, we can put uh, amyloid angiopathy and multiple cavernous malformations, that is cavernomas in the differentials. Next is a 45 year old woman presenting with history of uh, uh, stage 4 gastroesophageal junction adenocarcinoma, now presenting with slurred speech and ataxia and uh, these are the imaging sequences. So on the flare sequence, we can see that uh, there is curvy linear curvy linear hyper intense signal which is outlining the cerebellar folia. These are the cerebellar folia and this curvy linear hyper intense signal is outlining the cerebellar folia. On the post contrast sequences here we can see that uh, there is linear and uh, nodular enhancement which is coating the surfaces of the cerebellum and cones of course. Cerebellum this is the linear enhancement, linear and nodular enhancement which is coating the surfaces of the cerebellum and pons. So this is a case of leptomeningeal carcinomatosis. These imaging pictures are quite typical for leptomeningeal carcinomatosis. This is a case of leptomeningeal carcinomatosis and in the differentials of course we can put sarcoidosis, infectious meningitis and vaginous granulomatosis and other inflammatory disorders. Next is uh, a 13 year old girl uh, presenting uh, with short stature and frequent headaches and uh, these are the sequences provided here. So we can see that there is a large cystic cellar and supracellar mass here, okay. There is a large cystic and uh, cellar and supracellar mass which is showing this nodular mural enhancement. So these are the post contrast sequences. You can see nodular mural enhancement in this cystic lesion. Basically, predominantly this is cystic lesion and this is large cystic lesion. It is located in the cellar and supracellar region and there is nodular uh, mural enhancement in this lesion. 
this cyst this cystic lesion is uh, it is as you can see that it is uh, hyper intense on flare sequence this is the flare sequence and it is uh, hyper intense on uh, flare it is hyper intense on flare which is consistent with the proteinaceous contents it is deforming the cella and uh, also it is uh, compressing the pituitary the third ventricle here you can see that it is deforming the cella it is compressing here it is compressing the pituitary and it is compressing the third ventricle and the, it is here you can see it is compressing the third ventricle and the brain stem it is compressing the third ventricle and the brain stem so this is quite typical imaging picture of craniopharyngioma this is from another patient this is the ct image from another patient which is shown here to show that on ct it can give coarse calcifications so these coarse calcifications on ct in this location are quite characteristic for craniopharyngioma in the differentials you can put rathic left cyst dermoid epidermoid cyst and uh, germinoma cystic pituitary adenoma hypothalamic chiasmatic glioma and partially thrombosed aneurysm so this is a case of an 8 year old boy presenting with the new onset of epilepsy so these are the pictures provided here on the contrast uh, enhanced ct scan there is a non calcified nodular mass here in the subependymal region of the left lateral ventricle this is the left lateral ventricle and uh, this is the left lateral ventricle and in the subependymal region we can see a non calcified nodular mass on the t2 weighted sequence uh, we can see that this lesion here this is the lesion and here in the coronal scan this is the lesion t2 weighted mri coronal sequence this is the lesion and this is the lesion on post contrast scan this is the post contrast scan and this is the lesion on the post contrast scan so we can see that there is no enhancement in this lesion on the post contrast scan and it is following the signal changes of gray matter on both t2 weighted sequence here and in the post contrast sequence it does not enhance it is following the signals of gray matter this signal and this signal of gray matter is quite similar as you can see this is the signal of this lesion and this is the gray matter so the, these uh, signals are quite similar so it follows the signals of gray matter on the post contrast sequence there is no enhancement so these imaging pictures are quite typical for gray matter heterotopia this is a case of gray matter heterotopia and uh, in the differentials you can put sub ependymal nodules of tuberous sclerosis and uh, normal body and tail of chordate nucleus can also be put in the differential next is uh, routine second trimester prenatal uh, ultrasound in a mother uh, who is suffering from diabetes and uh, this is the imaging picture unfortunately i would say and uh, as you can see that these are the ultrasound images of the fetal head and they show absence of the cranial vault altogether there is no absence of there is total absence of cranial vault and supratentorial brain structures above the orbit so only the eyeballs and the orbits are shown here and there is total absence of any brain structure whatsoever above the cranial vault there is absence of cranial vault there is no skull here there is absence of cranial vault and absence of the supratentorial brain structures so this frog eye picture this is called frog eye and this is quite typical of the an encephaly case so this is a case of an encephaly and uh, this is quite typical picture of an encephaly that is called frog eyed appearance of the fetus and in the differentials you can put a crania a large encephalocele or meningocele severe microcephaly and the amniotic brain amniotic band syndrome can also be put in the differential so next case of a 6 year old boy presenting with headache and fever so these are the imaging pictures and uh, 
as you can see that uh, this is the post contrast T1 weighted MRI and it shows thick leptomeningeal enhancement along the basal cisterns and sylvian fissures okay along the basal cisterns and sylvian fissures and thinner uh, leptomeningeal enhancement here this is quite thinner leptomeningeal enhancement here thinner leptomeningeal enhancement uh, along the brain surface and uh, there is a uh, intracerebral extension uh, to the inferior left frontal lobe okay there is intracerebral extension of this enhancement to the inferior left uh, frontal lobe also you can see that there is marked ventricular megaly here there is marked ventricular megaly and uh, there is an arachnoid cyst in the right middle cranial fossa and uh, it may be incidental or it may be as a result of the inflammatory exudate but you can see that uh, here you can see that this is the arachnoid cyst in the right middle cranial fossa so this is a case of tuberculous meningitis and in the differentials you can put uh, pyogenic meningitis fungal or amoebic meningitis lymphoma or uh, leptomeningeal carcinomatosis or sarcoidosis. Next case is of a three year old boy presenting with seizures and uh, there is a birth mark on the left side of the upper face. These are the images provided. So on the axial non-contrast CT uh, we can see that there are uh, curvilinear here, curvilinear and uh, gyriform calcifications in the left cerebral hemisphere here. Curvilinear and gyriform calcifications in the left cerebral hemisphere. On the T2 weighted MRI, this is the T2 weighted MRI axial sequence. There is a quite subtle focal volume loss in the left occipitoparietal region here. It is very subtle as you can see it is quite subtle but it is present here focal volume loss in the left occipitoparietal region. On the post contrast uh, sequences we can see that this is the axial and this is the coronal sequence post contrast and there is uh, intense leptomeningeal enhancement along the uh, uh, there is this is the intense leptomeningeal enhancement here and uh, we can see also that there is uh, asymmetric enlargement and enhancement of the left choroid plexus. So we can see that this is the choroid plexus and it is enlarged compared to the right choroid plexus. It is enlarged and also it is enhancing. There is enhancement of this choroid plexus. There is enhancement of choroid plexus here compared to the right choroid plexus. This uh, uh, in enlargement and uh, enlargement and enhancement of the choroid plexus along with the uh, leptomeningeal enhancement in this region. Uh, also, there is uh, focal volume loss and there is these gyriform calcification. So, these imaging uh, descriptions are quite typical for Sturge-Weber syndrome, uh, which is also called encephalotrigeminal angiomatosis. Uh, this is a typical imaging presentation of Sturge-Weber syndrome. And in the differentials, you can put meningitis because of the leptomeningeal enhancement uh, along with leptomeningeal metastasis, other vascular malformations and uh, subacute infarcts with enhancement can also be put in the differential. Another case of a 59 year old patient presenting with seizures and lethargy and uh, these are the images provided. So as you can see that there is a large, this is the large peripherally enhancing mass which is expanding the left cerebral hemisphere and uh, there is extensive extensive surrounding high intense signal on flare sequence and uh, the signal this is the post contrast scan and you can see that there is uh, enhancement in this lesion this signal normality and enhancement in this lesion is seen to be crossing the corpus callosum 
and involving the right parietal lobe. So this signal abnormality, that is this enhancement, and this is that signal abnormality that we are talking about on flare. It is crossing the corpus callosum, it is crossing the corpus callosum to involve the right parietal lobe. And uh, also we can see uh, that there are areas of uh, elevated cerebral blood volume here, there are areas of elevated cerebral blood volume uh, within this enhancing tissue. This is the enhancing tissue which is showing elevated cerebral blood volume. So this is a typical case of uh, GVM that is glioblastoma multiform. This is a typical case of glioblastoma multiform and in the differentials you can put abscess, metastasis, tumor effective uh, demyelination and uh, lymphoma and radiation necrosis as well. Next is a 60 year old man uh, presenting with the depression, suffering from depression, 60 year old man and uh, these are the images provided. Now as you can see that there are, there are symmetric areas of calcification which are centered in the dentate nuclei, these are the dentate nuclei, they are centered in the dentate nuclei and in the lentiform nuclei, you can see they are centered in the lentiform nuclei, in the thalami bilateral, you know, in the bilateral thalami, in the bilateral lentiform nuclei and subcortical white matter. You can see here this is subcortical white matter. So these are all these symmetric areas of calcification. So this is quite typical imaging uh, picture of far disease. This is a typical imaging picture of Faher disease and in the differentials uh, uh, you can say um, hypoparathyroidism, pseudo hypoparathyroidism and hyperparathyroidism. This is a case of Faher disease. Now another case of 16 year old girl presenting with headaches and these are the images provided. So as you can see that uh, here, there is a well circumscribed ovoid lesion in the left centrum semi well. This is the well circumscribed ovoid lesion in the left centrum semi well, and uh, this lesion is uh, on T2 weighted images. We can see that uh, it has a rim of uh, markedly hypo intense signal. This is that hypo intense rim. It has a rim of marked hyperintensity and a central uh, multiseptate area of hyperintense signal. So this is the central hyperintense area, septate area, central multiseptate area of hyperintense signal, along with a rim of marked hyperintensity. Also on the post contrast uh, sequence, uh, you can see that there is a uh, Curvy linear enhancement. This is that curvy linear enhancement which is adjacent to this lesion. Uh, this is the curvy linear enhancement which is adjacent to this lesion. Here, this is the lesion and this is that curvy linear enhancement, and you can see that this could be possibly a small uh, developmental venous anomaly that is DVA. Also, this is the susceptibility weighted imaging and it is showing blooming of the signal loss there is blooming signal loss here associated with this lesion which is basically corroborating with the presence of blood products that is, there are blood products here. So this is a very typical imaging picture of cavernous malformation that is generally called cavernoma or cavernous malformation and in the differentials you can put because this is blood product so you can put hemorrhagic metastasis here or any other hemorrhagic etiology like arteriovenous malformation or amyloid angiopathy or diffuse axonal injury. So this is in a, another case of a four-year-old uh, child presenting with seizures and developmental delay and white patches on the skin. This is the history, white patches on the skin. These are the images provided. So you can see that on this uh, axial non-contrast CT scan, there are multiple foci uh, this is, these are the axial non-contrast CT scan and there are multiple foci of uh, subcortical and uh, cortical uh, hypoattenuation in the brain uh, bilaterally. So these are uh, the bilateral 
uh, hypoattenuation areas subcortical and cortical and uh, in some areas uh, you can see I wasn't talking about these areas I mean hypoattenuating foci are these areas subcortical and cortical hypoattenuating areas these are the subcortical and hypoattenuating areas. Now there are foci of subcortical calcification this is the subcortical calcification this is the subcortical calcification this is the subcortical calcification that we are talking about and uh, there are a multiple densely or partially calcified nodules you can see here there are multiple densely or partially calcified nodules along the ependival surface of the lateral ventricles the flare sequence here this is the flare sequence and uh, the flare sequence here shows numerous areas of cortical and subcortical high signal intensity okay these are the multiple areas here 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 you can see here multiple areas of cortical and subcortical high signal intensity and uh, on the post contrast sequence you can see that there are enhancing nodular masses near the foramina of Monroe bilaterally so these are the enhancing nodular masses which are present uh, in the near the foramina of Monroe these are the enhancing nodular masses bilaterally and these are all those cortical and subcortical hyper intense areas on flare sequences also these masses can be shown here they can they are easily they can be noticed here as well on flare sequence so these are the typical imaging uh, descriptions of tuberous sclerosis this is a case of tuberous sclerosis and in the differentials you can put congenital infections that is torch and multiple subependymal gray matter heterotropias however they do not calcify